Next slide. So we're going to begin our presentation with the Matrix Human Services mission statement as well as the vision. So their mission statement, inspired by its heritage since 1906, Matrix Human Services advocates for and serves the most vulnerable in the metropolitan Detroit community and empowers individuals and families to enhance the quality of their lives and achieve self-sufficiency. And Matrix Vision. Matrix, a proven leader in uniting all humans, service efforts to move individuals and families towards self-sufficiency. In our time, with your help, eradicating poverty of the mind, body, and spirit. My name is Lisa Williams. I have 30 years of child care experience. Out of the 30 years, I've operated a home, a licensed home daycare for 11. I worked at Focus Hope as an early Head Start and as a Head Start teacher. I was also an interim educational specialist who later became the educational specialist for GSRP. Now I am the child development specialist for Make Human Services over two sites, Early Learning Prep and Franklin Wright Settlement. My partner will introduce herself and give you a little information about her background. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Sasha Edmondson. I am currently the Child Developmental Specialist for our seven home provider child care centers. That is House of Joy, Young Faith, Willis Wonderland, Carly's Home, Fun Time, Say's Home, and Home Away from Home. Um, I started my career in Early Head Start um, seven years ago at Focus Hope. I was there as a substitute um, slash part-time teacher. Um, shortly after that, I was hired into New St. Paul Head Start when they began their Early Head Start program. Um, and there I was the lead teacher for the very first time. It was a very exciting and scary experience because I had never been the lead teacher before but I truly and thoroughly enjoyed being in the classroom with the toddlers. Um, from there in October of 2017, I was promoted to their mentor coach over all of the early Head Start centers. Um, that was about seven centers and three of their childcare partnerships. So I had a total of about 12 classrooms um, that I oversaw as their mentor coach. Um, and that's it. Okay, now we're going to move on to our icebreakers. If you have your cell phone, ladies, I'm going to choose five people, and I want to know what your screen lock picture is. So let's start with Lindsey Gray. Unmute yourself and tell us what your screen lock picture is. I'm sorry, can you repeat you said what my what? Your screen lock picture on your cell phone. For instance, my screen lock picture, I have two fur babies. So I have one on here, which is Trotter, because I don't get to see him every day. But everybody know who Sassy is, so yeah. So oh, explain okay. to us what your screen lock picture is. My screen lock picture is a picture of my sister and my two-year-old nephew uh, in their garden. Oh, OK, OK. Yeah. Good, like that. Um, I Let's see. Let's. Wanda, Nathan, come on down. Tell us about your screen lock picture. Uh, my screen lock picture is a picture of myself uh, um, at my 20th vow renewal. We we had a wedding for our 20th anniversary. So. Oh, okay. Dress. <laughs> okay, good, good. I like that. I like that. Thank you. Um. <laughs> See who we have. Nancy Long, come on down. Tell us about your screen lock picture. Hello? Yes. Oh, I do not have a screen lock picture on my phone because I okay. just received this phone. Okay. <laughs> and that's okay. That's fine. Hmm. You see someone you want to call, Sasha? Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Um, 
please mute your uh, volumes, please. Yeah, that sounds like Ja or Mulatto. Um, how about um, Candace Alexander? Candace Alexander, can you unmute your um, phone and let us know what your screen lock saver is? Hello, guys. My screen lock um, photo is me and my husband at our um, wedding anniversary. Well, our wedding. Okay. 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 All right. Congratulations. Uh, Thank you. Well, we got one more. One more. What about... Um, Leanne, L-E-E-Y-E-N, Williams. Miss Leanne? No, Miss Leanne? Yeah. You want to okay. know my picture? Yes. Ms. I have a picture of the silver fox on my screen. Well, all right now. <laughs> silver fox, all right. Silver fox, okay. Thank you, ladies, for participating. Moving right along. Okay. We're going to review our focus uh, domains. So we'll be going over two. Could you please mute your okay. Okay. All right. Ladies, please mute your microphones. I need to go through and start uh, calling them out. Mute, mute ourselves at mute them. Yep. Okay, here we go. Um, section three, we're going to do adult child interaction. The focus areas is C, children adult partnership, page 54, and F, children's conflict resolution, page 63. Ladies, if you have a copy of the PQA, feel free to follow along um, in your book. That's not Problem. If you don't have it, no worries. We will be putting the um, pages up on the screen for you. Section four, curriculum and planning slash child observation. The focus areas will include B, child observation and planning, page 68, and assessing developmental progress, page 70, and that's letter C. Okay. Here we go with a quick poll. Are you familiar with PQA? Do I have that poll or you? I had it, but it's not logging, so let's just have them put it in the chat box. Okay. If you are, if you are familiar with the PQA in the chat box, put Y for yes, N for no. I see a lot of whys. I see a lot of whys. Okay. Oh, a lot of whys. Okay, okay, okay. okay. That's good. Good. A few ends. Okay. Okay. That that's awesome. Okay, everybody. That's awesome. Good. Thank you. Now, ladies, who can tell me what the letters P Q A stand for? Please put that in the chat box. Chat box then got quiet. Yeah. Oh. Okay, there we go. There we go. We got LaShawn Bridges program quality assessment. Performance quality assessment. Performance okay. quality assessment. Okay. Okay, okay. okay. Good. There All we right. go. Lighten up. <laughs> yes. Who has had a PQ observation? completed in their classroom? You can answer that with either Y for yes or N for no. A lot of, lot of Ys, a lot of Ys. And I'm assuming that those that were familiar with the PQA are the same ones that are giving the Ys for having had one done in their classroom before. Mm -hmm. All right, all right, all right. Okay. Thank you all. Um, one last thing. In your own words, who can give us a definition of the PQA assessment? 
If you can a... feel free to unmute yourself. And tell us exactly in your words what the PQA is used for. It's an observation of your class and how you run your daily schedule and your daily um, day with the children. Okay, can you say your name if you're unmuting? Say your name so oh, we know who's speaking. My name please. is Victoria Hall from Greater Ebenezer. Hello, okay. Ms. Victoria. Hello. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else want to give an answer for what the PQA is and what it's for? The PQA. This is Regina Bryant. Getting a lot of feedback right now. Anybody else? My name um, is Michelle Thomas. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, the PQA is an assessment that's used to assess the quality of the program. Okay. Okay, that's All right. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. The um, PQA, the Infant Toddler Program Quality Assessment, was developed to help caregivers, administrators, and other program staff assess the strengths of their programs and determine where improvements are needed. Okay. Next. So what we're gonna do is jump right into section about um, what adult child interaction is. Um, they describe adult in child interaction as a nurturing responsive teacher um, who practices primary caregiving and the continuity of care by scaffolding the individual needs and temperaments of infants and toddlers. Key strategies for adult child interactions are touching and holding, playing alongside infants and toddlers at their level and pace, communicating in a give and take exchanges for verbal and nonverbal children. You're going to respect the children's choices and encourage their effort acknowledging the children's strong emotions and involving toddlers in conflict resolution. So we all know since this COVID thing has been going on that adult child interaction is definitely going to look different. If you can see on the left side of the screen, the teacher is down at the children's level. They're all participating and you see that the children are in a close proximity to each other. Well, now due to COVID, we have to practice physical social distancing. And we're going to talk about how you can support children during adult child interaction during COVID-19. If you see on the right side of the screen, the children are still interacting with each other and they are kind of in a close proximity, but they're wearing those face masks to protect themselves. If you look towards the back of the picture, the teacher is there having some adult child interaction with the child, but she's also wearing her face mask as well. So, um, from a PowerPoint presentation that was given by the Early Head Start Education and Wellness, they had a presentation titled Caring for Children in a group setting during COVID. And this is one of the slides that they presented. And it says physical, not social distancing. So we still wanna keep that safe physical distance with the six feet apart, but social engagement is still very important. So we wanna keep the kids physically distant, but socially engaged with each other as well as with ourselves. It's very important, not only for the PQA, but for your every day. You wanna keep those children engaged with each other as well as with yourself because it helps them build social development skills and they also learn how to build trusting relationships with caregivers and others around them. Also, you wanna keep on hold bringing toys from home. We know sometimes children have that favorite toy or that blanket that they just have to have with them. But during this time, it's very important that they keep those things at home and also, those children that haven't seen you in a long time and haven't seen their friends in a long time, they want hugs. Naturally, even before COVID, when your students saw you and they were excited to see you, they ran up and gave you a hug. Oh, Miss Lisa, I'm so happy to see you. 
Oh, Miss Sasha, I'm so happy to see you. I missed you. I'm glad to see you. They were excited to do that. But unfortunately, due to COVID, we have to find other ways for them to show that they're happy to see us. So now what we're going to do is see a video from one of my favorites, Miss Abby Kadabi, and something that her mommy taught her. Come on, don't even like Hi everybody, it's me, Abby. My mommy set up this really neat little video chat place so I can visit with everybody. And I just, well, I wanted to talk to you because, well, I know a lot of us are having some big feelings right now. I know I am. And that's okay because, well, we're all in this together. And I've been spending a lot of time with my mommy and my stepdaddy, Freddie and my brother Rudy, and well, she taught me something really nice. I think you're gonna like it too. She said that when I have big feelings or little feelings or anything in between, I can just give myself a hug. That's this, a self hug, just like that. And it's really nice. I hold myself real tight, and I take a deep breath, and I feel comforted. And well, if you're having those feelings too, you give yourself a nice big hug and know that all of us here on Sesame Street are thinking of you and we're hugging you nice and tight. All right, well, you take care. Um, I love you and twinkle out. <laughs> Caring for each other. Visit sesamestreet.org slash caring for videos, activities, and tips for the whole family. Absolutely love Abby Kadabi. So one there second, she one second, Miss Sasha, because I got someone in the chat that said that they could not see the video. They couldn't see the video. Did anybody yes. else did have problems seeing the video? Anybody see the video or no? You can comment in the chat if you were not able to see the video. Okay, I'm seeing some yes. I did. Okay. Everybody was able to see, okay. Yeah, so that one person, she did not get to see the video. Okay, they could see in here. Okay. okay. So Abby Kadabi is one of my favorites. I, I love her spunk. <laughs> um, but she was saying how her mommy taught her how to give self-hugs um, in place of physically hugging another friend. So with that, what are some other ideas that you can bring into your classroom besides the self-hugs that children can practice to greet each other without physically touching each other. Um, let's see if um, we can get a few uh, responses in the chat box for that. What are some other ways children can greet each other in a classroom without actually touching each other? Okay, I see air hugs, air high fives, air handshakes, wave at each other, yes. Mm -hmm. um, sign, I love, I love you. you. That's a good one. That's nice, yes because we do actually have some classrooms that use sign language. Mm -hmm. Elbow bumps. Elbow okay. bumps. Fist, fist bumps. bumps. Okay. Air fives, air kisses. Yeah. All great ideas. Yes, yeah, so these are all really great ideas. So just keep that in mind when you have that child that's just so excited to see you and see their friends. And we definitely want to watch our tone and the words that we use when we're addressing this with children, we don't want to be harsh with our words because we don't want to make them feel bad that we have to uh, potentially stop them from hugging. So maybe you address their feelings. Yes, I know you would love to hug your friend, Leland, but right now it's just not a good idea. So maybe you can give them an air high five or wave at him or, you know, address their feelings and then a solution so they don't feel bad and they can still enjoy communicating with their friends. Wanda Nathan had a good idea. Happy dance. Hey everybody, I'm sorry. It's me, no, no, Abby. Let me get past hey, Mommy. I'm sorry. What'd you say, Miss Williams? Um, Wanda Nathan, she had a good idea. Happy dance. Oh yes, happy dance. Yeah. That you get a moving too. Yeah. Those those motor in. Yes, that would definitely work as well. 
So moving fist bumps, air hugs, fives, waves, kisses, or sing a song to them if you want to. I miss you, something like that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Whatever works for them. Set up this so really now we're going to get into the nitty gritty of the PQA. Um, we're going to start with section 3B. And here uh, we're going to discuss that throughout the day, throughout the day, throughout the day, children and caregivers interact at the children's pace. It's not just during breakfast time. It's just not during snack time. It's throughout the day. You want to stay engaged and at that child's pace because high scope is child led, I mean, child directed teacher led or vice versa. But you want to stay within the interest of those children. Um, when you're going outside, you want to let those children move and crawl at their own space and pace if possible. Um, we don't, you don't want to shove the children down the hallway. You don't want to have little Johnny by his wrist dragging him behind you because he's walking too slow. Um, so at their pace and make sure that you're acknowledging, oh, okay, I see you're moving a little bit slower than the others. Um, if you're in a classroom with two caregivers, that caregiver might be able to stay back as long as you stay in roast ratio and be with the slower moving children while maybe the other um, partner is with the the children that can move a little bit faster in pace. Um, as children wake up from their nap, you don't want to rush them from their cots or from their cribs and abruptly move them from the crib to the changing table or from their cots to the, the snack table because you are a little bit behind. You want to let those children wake up kind of naturally and let them get the, the go of, okay, I'm up from my nap. I'm ready to move on to the next thing. Um, for row six, throughout the day, children hear only positive comments from caregivers about themselves and from others. Positive comments about themselves and others. Some of the examples are, um, Sam and Carl like painting. You're addressing what the children like doing, and you're also addressing them by, by their names. Um, sometimes, um, if you have an infant that's in the classroom, for this example, um, children who like to, um, or maybe teething, you want to give them something to chew on. And as you're giving them that item, you can say, oh, that made your gums feel better. I see that that made you happy. Um, caregivers treat the children's soiled diapers with respect. And I'm going to speak about a personal matter. During my externship, um, when I was getting my CDA from Wayne County Community College, I went to a center that is no longer open. And when I was in the classroom with this teacher, the words that she used to speak to this child, you, you wouldn't think that she really liked children. She abruptly picked the baby up from the floor and said, oh my God, you smell like garbage. We need to change your diaper. Those are not the words that you want to use for any child at any time. All children should be spoke to in a respectful way manner. That, that kind of threw me for a loop. Um, so yes, please be respectful when you're talking to the children. So now we're going to move into um, part three, uh, section C, and we're going to go over rows three, four, and five. Here, throughout the day, children and caregivers communicate in a give and take exchange. Um, they can also use conversation involving gestures, sounds, and words. Here, for an example, you can be sitting over in the rocking chair and little Brenda brings you over a book and she can't really talk, but she brings you a book and she sits it in your lap. Instead of just saying, oh, you have a book, or sometimes even just ignoring them, you would respond to little Brenda, oh, I see you have Chicka Chicka Boom Boom. Would you like to sit down and read the book with me? If she would like to sit down and read the book with you, she might proceed to try to sit next to you or something like that. And if she doesn't, she might just walk away. Either way, you've given her a chance to respond to an action and a work that you've given her. For row four, throughout the day, children hear few directors from caregivers that are non-harsh. 
Again, I'm going to repeat, they're non-harsh. You use pleasant, unhurried tones when you're speaking to the children. When it's time for them to go to the bathroom, it's not, come on, let's go wash our hands so we can get back in here and have snack. No, thank you. We want to use our nice, unhurried words. Okay, let's walk to the bathroom so we can wash our hands, and then we can come back and we can sit down at the table and have snack. If you see children, mostly sometimes infants that might be kind of grabbing at each other, we can tell them gentle touches, please, not stop hitting them. Don't do that. Go sit down. That will not get you a level five. Um, that's more so a level three. We definitely want, do not want to go down to level one indicators of yelling, come here, or don't make me count to five, or go wash your hands now. Those are harsh words, and they're also directives that we do not want to use in the classroom during PQA or ever. At row five, Throughout the day, children hear many caregivers' acknowledgments and comments. They're directed towards what the children's actions, interests, ideas, and feelings are. So if someone is, a child is sitting at the table and they used all of the crayons to make a picture and they show it to you and you just say, oh, that's nice. You want to be more specific when you're talking to that child. Oh, I see you used all the colors to make your picture. Or, oh, I see you made lots of circles on your coloring. Those are the types of things that um, would go towards acknowledgments and comments directly towards what that child is doing. And sometimes teachers don't even do that in the classroom. They just say, oh, or and don't. Um, recognize or refer to what the children is feeling, and that would be a level one. So we want to stay in that level five indicator column. So next here, we're going to do a little activity. Um, the comments are already on the screen. So we're going to see if you can determine if it's an encouragement or a praise comment. So for the first one, um, Kevin, you ate all of your vegetables. If you think it is an encouragement or a praise, put either a E or a P in the comment section. That first comment, would that be encouragement or would that be praise? Anybody out there? Hello. They putting them in the in the chat box. Okay. Oh, talking to chat box. I'm sorry. You can say it out if you want. You can say it out loud if you want. Yep. Encouragement. Encouragement. Okay. Let's see. That is encouragement. The next one. Wow, Leland, that looks awesome. Would that be encouragement or praise? Praise. Praise. Anybody else think it's praise? Praise. Praise. Chat box like praise. Up, praise. Okay. Okay. Let's see. That is praise, and that's praise because we we're we're giving a positive, but we're not giving what the positive is exactly about. What looks awesome? His shirt looks awesome. The mess that he made on the snack table looks awesome. The milk he spilled on the floor looks awesome. What specifically looks awesome? The next one. Keep going, Ashley. You're almost to the shelf. Encouragement. 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 Yes, yes, yes. Encouragement. Encouragement. Because... Great, great. Yes, because we're noti we're noticing what the child is doing. They're trying to get to the shelf, but we're encouraging them. Keep on going. You're almost there. Don't, that's like, you can do it. You can do it. Giving them that, that comment, I'm almost there. I can do it. Just a little bit further to go. So that is encouragement. And the last one. Great job, Nate. <laughs> praise. 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 Because we don't know what the praise. great job was. Great job that 
hitting Nathan in the arm. Great job at filling all the anything on the floor. Right. So you want to be specific and direct with what you're referring to when you're talking to the children. So now we're going to get into older infants and toddlers that participate in resolving conflict. And believe it or not, conflict resolution does exist between infants and toddlers. Believe it or not. So can anybody unmute their microphone and give me the six steps of conflict resolution in order? Anybody, anybody? Wow. Did anybody get those? I had them, but they wasn't in that order. Okay. <laughs> I had them too, but they wasn't in that order neither. Same okay. here, wasn't in the order. It's okay, but, but as long as we know them, we can identify them, but we want to try to get them in the order. So the first one would definitely be approach calmly to stop any hurtful actions. Again, calmly. We don't want to run up to a situation. We don't want to yell across the room to a situation. We want to approach calmly, get down on the children's level. Next, you want to acknowledge your children's feelings both children, not just one. You want to acknowledge the feelings of both children. You then want to gather information about what the problem could possibly be. Fourth would be to restate the problem that you think you heard. And sometimes you may think you know the problem, but what you think is the problem is not really the problem, it's something else. So it's always good to restate. And if your children are old enough, those older toddlers and going into it started to be like, well, no, that wasn't the problem. That's why it's always good to restate. Fifth would be to ask the children for their ideas and solutions and that they both come to a solution together, not to let it be one-sided. And also be prepared to give follow-up support to those children. You might want to just stand off to the side for a few minutes and see if the actual solution that they came up with is working. And if it's not, you might need to step back in and do a little more um, conflict resolution with those children. So we're actually going to see some conflict resolution in action in just a minute. Um, but here at level one, um, if this is, uh, this does not um, account to you if you only have um, children zero to six months in your classroom. And so the qualifying question will be, how do you handle conflicts between children? That level five, you definitely want to make sure that you say involved, in, each child is involved in the conflict resolution and receives positive attention of the caregiver who approaches the children calmly and is ready um, to give them help. At the start of the conflict, you immediately stop any hurtful actions hitting, kicking, throwing, anything like that. Um, for example, um, you may say to a child that's kicking, the kicking needs to stop because it hurts. And you can sit down between those two children and let them know that. Um, you, again, you always want to stay down at their level. If you see two toddlers that are pulling at a truck, you sit down between them and you hold the truck until you can kind of come to a solution with them, but you're, you're giving both of them that physical attention. Maybe you're patting one on the shoulder and you're holding the other one's hands, but you're giving both children an equal amount of attention. For row two, again, if there are only zero to six months in the classroom, this, this does not uh, pertain to you. But after approaching children in the conflict calmly, the caregiver helps the children resolve the problem by giving positive and respectful support to each child. You want to acknowledge the feelings of the child until they're calm. If both children are crying, you can't really begin to do that conflict resolution. So you want to make sure that both of the children are calm and being attentive to what's being said. You also want to help those nonverbal children communicate with each other 
by labeling feelings. Oh, you look upset. You both look upset. I see that you wanted to use the same block as Alexander. How can we solve this? For older infants, um, you can offer duplicates of uh, same materials, maybe like it's a baby doll or um, a rattle or something like that. Provide an extra one for that child to kind of help them. You're solving the problem for them actually, but they have the idea that, okay, I can have what they have at the same time. For row three, this will pertain to you if you have children 18 to 36 uh, months of age. Um, with the caregiver's encouragement, each child in a conflict participates in identifying the problem. If the child can communicate what the problem is from their point of view, the caregiver will restate the problem based on their observation and the children's verbal and nonverbal cues. And here is where I was saying you might know the problem and you might not. Children can affirm or correct the caregiver's restatement of the problem. And the example in the PQA book is um, she assumed that the child wanted the red truck, but Jalen then says, no, I want the blue truck. And the caregiver replied, oh, so you want the blue truck. So going back and cre um, correcting what you thought the problem was so that they know that you're listening to them. Um, row four, again, 18 to 36 months. Caregivers are going to encourage each child in the conflict in providing and choosing a solution for the problem. Each child will identify I'm sorry, each child will generate ideas for the solutions and choose one together and then receive follow-up care from the support, follow-up support from their caregiver. So the caregiver will ask both children what they think an idea is. If they both agree to one of the ideas, then that's fine. But also as the caregiver, you can also give your input by saying, well, would you like to hear my idea? Would you like to hear how I think it might work out? That way, if they can't themselves come up with something and you have something in mind, you're still giving them chance to you're still giving them the chance to participate in the conflict resolution, but then you giving them a solution and kind of help them work it out. So here we're actually going to observe um, some conflict resolution in action. puppet show you want a puppet show and that's the problem so what are we going to do to solve your problem oh the problem is daquan hit you over here all right let me let's get nick daquan and see if we can solve the problem with daquan 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 we have a problem over here i need to help noel and you solve your problem could you come over here okay i'm going to hold on to these puppets while we talk Daquan, you just you look a little upset too. What happened? No, Noel said there's some, there's a problem about hitting. What happened? Okay, both of you don't like this hitting. Okay, the problem is hitting. Do you have any um, any idea what the problem about? Yeah. What, what? Don't hit. That's how you want to solve the problem. Joel. Noel. Daquan said to solve the problem. He said don't hit. Did that solve the problem? Daquan, please don't hit me. Oh, you want to say to Daquan, please don't hit me. That's what Noel wants to say to solve the problem. So that's how we're going to solve the problem. And you're going to get one puppet. So we solved the problem. We solved the problem. Okay.
Okay. We'll now dive into our second half, which will include curriculum planning and child observations. But before moving forward, I would like to um, explain something to you guys about this training. This training is not to teach you how to score a PQA, but what we're doing is providing you with leadership skills to score the highest possible score during your PQA observation. Okay, um, question number one. What tool is used to observe the children? You can put your answers in the chat and I'm gonna call on a few people to see if they can provide me with the right answer. All righty. Michelle Thomas. What tool is used to observe the children? Anecdotal notes and core. Okay, that's right. Anybody agree, disagree, or have something else that they use outside of core advantage, which you shouldn't. All right, our next question. Are you familiar with the curriculum used in our Early Head Start program? Uh, let's see who we have. Is that Carice? Hodges, am I saying that right? Yes, that's correct. You said it right. Okay. So what curriculum? We use high school. Okay. Is that it? Yes. Okay. Now, um, as far as the curriculum, that is correct. We do use high school, but we also use the infant and toddler 30 day lesson plan. These are gonna be some type of, of questions that they'll ask you when observing your classroom. Okay, my next slide. The documentation that we currently use, which we just went over, include the 30-day lesson plan for both infant and toddlers. The tool utilized observation is called the core advantage scoring guide. All right, when observing children to take anecdotal notes, we use the core advantage. We score children at their developmental level. Usually we score between zero and three, depending on the child's age. Now, in some cases, I've seen children score higher, but we always want to score children at their level of understanding to ensure that we are providing a quality note. Example of this, um, say for instance, you have a little boy, we'll call him Johnny in your classroom. Now we know that we're trying to get Johnny to be able to write his name or write circles or even grasp a pencil. Now, in your anecdotal notes, you say that little Johnny can grasp a pencil. Now, when the observer comes in, which will probably be, which will be your child development specialist, when she comes in and she sits and she sees this note, but she sees little Johnny can't even grasp a crayon, then we know little Johnny can't grasp a pencil. So that's not a quality note. You always want to make sure that you're taking a note at that child's level, not where you want them to be. You want to make sure that if you are trying to get a child from a two to a three, plan activities around that, that will help support that child get from a two to a three. Don't just automatically write a note and say a child is doing something when that child has not reached that level. Okay, doing um, the next slide. During um, your observation, the assessor will be looking for certain evidence and asking clarifying questions. Your response to the questions will determine your level score. The clarifying question asked in this domain is a two-part question. First part, how do you observe your children? The second part, how do you interpret the development that you see in infants and toddlers every day? You will want to give an answer that includes six elements. In your own words, the 
examples are, but not limited to, um, one, approaches to learning, how children make choices, solve problems, two, social and emotional development, how children form attachment, express emotions, three, physical development, health, how children move their bodies and move with objects, four, communication, language, and literacy, how children listen, respond, communicate non-verbally, speak, and explore books. Five, cognitive development. How children explore objects, form objects, permanence, learn number concepts. And six, creative arts. How children imitate, pretend, explore art materials, listen, and respond to music. The second part of the question, how do you interpret the development that you see in infants and toddlers every day? Caregivers should work at children's own level instead of pushing them to the next level, like I mentioned before. Always work at their level because you can easily, if you're trying to push a child to the next level and that child is not quite ready to go to that next level, you can, you, that child will become discouraged. And every time that child sees you come, they'll sometimes clam up like, okay, here we go. It's almost like you're giving them a test. So we wanna make sure that we are letting kids work at their level, their pace, and not pushing them too fast. Okay, row two. Clarifying questions that will be asked by the assessor. What kind of information do you write down as you observe infants and toddlers throughout the day? In this section, you wanna make sure that you're taking quality notes throughout the day. Make sure the anecdotal note has the who, where, and the what. Your note should be what you see and what you hear, not what you think or what you want it to be, but what you're actually seeing and what you're actually hearing. The next one, the clarifying question that will be asked, how do you use the information you write down? You should answer this question as follows. I share anecdotal notes with parents daily during home visit to parent teachers conferences one and two um a parent may decide okay well today i might want to speak with miss lisa regarding my child's development progress okay well that could be the day as well too you made it you probably didn't have a meeting schedule but maybe now well now they'll probably be calling because of the new COVID rules so you may have parents calling instead of walking in and asking you, okay, well, what's going on? How's my child doing? Um, are they where they're supposed to be as far as, um, as, far as their development? So be, be ready to explain and tell parents about the progress that their children are making inside the uh, classroom. The next one. Now we come to the second part of the presentation. This has row three rows. And okay, so when there's one teacher in the classroom, who do you talk to? Who do you bounce ideas off of? One of the centers that I'm over, early learning prep. At this center, there's one teacher in each classroom. One day I was there before COVID and I witnessed, and what I witnessed was the teachers were bouncing ideas off of each other. Even though they were in three different classrooms, dealing with three different age groups, they were still bouncing ideas off of each other. You can bounce ideas off of each other and ask because, example, I remember I was working in the um, early Head Start classroom and the teacher who classroom that I like to go visit, she was a Head Start teacher. Um, head, I mean, well, preschool teacher, I should say, because Head Start hadn't came in quite yet. So I went to her room and she, were, she was teaching the kids uh, their letters and signs. And what she had was she had balloons. Now we know, now we can't use balloons in the classroom. But she had balloons in the classroom and she had the letters wrote on the balloons. She would make the letters sound and the kids would have to go and find the balloons. And when they found the balloon, they gave her the letter, the sound, and something that began with that letter. Then they would go and try to shoot the basket with the balloon. 
Well, by me working with Smart, I, I see what's going on. Knew that um, balloons were on. Put that bike down. Uh, go get on your bike. So, I couldn't use um, balloons. But what I did do was I went and bought the little colored balls. And we were working on farm animals. So what I did was I used a contact paper and I cut out the faces of the different farm animals. And I glued the farm animals on the ball. And what I did was say, for instance, if I wanted the kids to go and find the cow, I would say, okay, y'all, I need you guys to go find, moo, moo. And the kids would go around in the balls and look for it and look for it. And then when they found it, give me the least of the cow, the cow, the cow. And then they had the basket that they can throw the uh, ball. Now, the reason I used the basket was because of hand and eye coordination as well, as them learning they farm animals too. Okay. The next one, um, clarifying questions in this section. How do you assess children's development progress? Okay, so let me see the chat box light up with this answer. There are other ways outside of CORE that you can um, show a parent their child's development progress. Let me see if you guys know some other ideas outside of CORE that you can use. Or if anybody want to speak, you can speak as well. Victoria Hall, you have your IELPs. Okay, IELPs. I see the Dota notes on in the chat. Correct. Anyone else? Okay. I know when I was in the classroom, I use uh portfolios, along with my anecdotal notes, along with my ILPs and all of that, I would also, um, I would have work from when the child first came into the classroom in the middle of the school year, then towards the end. So this way I had concrete evidence to show the parent their child's progress along the way of being in my classroom. Like for instance, a parent wanted a child um, to write. Okay, so when the child first entered the room, the child was scribbling. All right, so when I had that form of evidence to show, then in the middle, she started making, like just making circles, 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 circles. And by the end, she could make the letter A. So I was able to show that parent the progress that that child made from beginning to end. So you guys can also use portfolio. Okay, at my old center, we use that and we use profile on what they have done. Yes, you can. Open-ended questions, yes. Yeah, anecdotal notes and ILPs, yes. And um, ladies, I also want to say too, be mindful that when you do sit down with your home visit for your very first home visit, make sure that you have all your documents there that you need for the parent to sign or that you're gonna to talk to the parent with over the phone. So that way you have everything there, you can get everything signed the way that it needs to be signed and you're not scrambling around looking for papers. So when you do sit down, have everything, all of your documents that you need at that time. I choose the way to show teams their child progress. Yes, that's a good idea. We well. have any, <laughs> any questions? No questions from anybody from the, the first portion or Miss Lisa's portion. Okay. Um, somebody says, since we're not doing parent-teacher conferences, how will they sign the documents? The teacher, um, you will either sign over the phone or you're going to sign virtual meeting. So couldn't we do the home visits like on Zoom since the COVID is going around? That's where you will sign virtual meeting. If you, have a, if you have a parent and you guys are on Zoom, the teacher's gonna be responsible to sign that document and that's gonna say 
virtual meeting or over the phone? Any other questions? We use Zoom for all of our meetings. Okay. That's fine. So pretty much whatever um, common media that you use, be it Zoom or Google Meetings, Teams, something that could be documented to where you can hold a successful um, home visit parent teachers conference, whatever it is, just make sure that you're signing how you met with that uh, family. Exactly. Okay, now will we need the question? Will we need the parents' signatures on the papers? If, and, and that's what we're saying where you would sign virtual meeting because they couldn't physically be there to sign. Right. Okay. So you would either write over the phone. Basically, you would write how if you had a virtual meeting on Zoom, that's what you will write in the parent signature. If you had over the mm -hmm. That's what you will write in the parent signature with the date. Yep, with the date. Any other questions, ladies? Or gentlemen, if Mr. Del Rico is online, I didn't see his name. When do we meet? When do we meet? Age again? Age. Is that again or a what? Cynthia Martin? We see your question. When do we meet? Is that again? Yes. When do like am I supposed to um do another Zoom call with y'all? Is this like the only one we have? Like are we supposed to meet again to like another trainer? That's basically my question. Um oh um so you mean like for the PQA or just overall? Uh for the PQA, yes, ma'am. Oh for the PQA. Well, yeah, um, for, so for the PQA, this was actually the last session. Um, okay, no, the I other just, two sessions were uh, Monday and Tuesday. Yeah, the okay, next no, time I you hear about a PQA, asking. we'll be out doing observation. Okay, no problem. I was just wondering. Okay. Any other questions, ladies? So tomorrow, there is another training um, for the... I can't think of the name of it. Miss Lisa, help me out. The um, Nourish to Flourish. Care. Nourish to Flourish is the last meeting that we have for this week um, in this series. It's just a um, kind of thank you kind of day, a, a self-care type of meeting um, that will be presented by one of our um, CDSs, Miss Charlotte Brown, um, that she put together. So um, hopefully you all will enjoy it tomorrow. But for now, we would like to thank you for attending our One presentation second. this evening. Oh, One sorry. second, Miss Sasha. Um, uh -huh. Sean Bostic. Yes. She, she need a link, a link for tomorrow's training. So okay. she'll let um, Miss Viandra. Yeah. Me as her. well. Cynthia Martin need one as well, a link for tomorrow. Cynthia Martin. I'm sorry. Hi, this is Andrea. The link will be sent out in the morning. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. Me and Ms. Lisa would like to thank everybody for <laughs> attending our presentation. This I'm sorry, my niece is just so excited. We would like to thank everyone for attending our presentation this evening for adult child interaction, um, curriculum planning, and child observations. We do hope that this review um, will really help you prepare your classroom and be ready to receive those scores of fives. Um, if you do have any additional comments or concerns, feel free to contact your child developmental specialist um, in whichever way they prefer you to contact them. And again, thank you for enjoying and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Ladies. Stay out for a second. Good night. All right, everybody. You told me to stay on for a second, Sasha. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, sure, Stop recording.